Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my two guests from Canada. Welcome, Robert. Hello, Arnie. Good to see you again. No worries. Pleased to have you, Robert. And Wallace. Welcome, Wallace. Well, good morning. I mean, actually, uh, good evening, Arnie. You're taking me off guard here. Uh, That's it. Yeah, good to see you again, too. Yeah, we missed you uh, last week. I'm pleased to see you back and everything's working properly. Uh, except that I can't get on the cloud. I'm somehow barred from the cloud. They say for some mysterious unknown cause. Okay. Well, maybe you just deserve to be. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. Uh, no worries. All right. Let's have a look at the... Um... It is interesting, actually, that comment. Wally, I'm just going to respond to that. I had a contact um, in India, and I reasonably regularly received notes on the uh, timeline on my Facebook page. And since the um, biased news reporting, it really is propaganda in regard to the um, what's going on in India, um, I have been unable to find him, to relocate. Now, he's either had his Facebook page scrapped his contact scrapped, or they're, um, they've actually moved in to separate he and I. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, you, you're mentioning about the difficulty with the cloud. And these are all, to me, these are all considerations of um, what are the rules? Well, I think there are no rules. And this is um, the, the nature of this game is that people who can collaborate um, will be um, finding it more and more difficult. Um, to collaborate. Okay, let's um, let's cut across to our news services. So, front page Australian. I think it's important that we um, we look now. I, I, I describe what's going on in Australia as we're moving into an election, a pre-election pre-election uh, footing for the federal government, and that these uh, changing images uh, in the centre of the page are in regard to uh, marketing them actually marketing. And of course, the speech is coming from our Prime Minister. Um, I find him a, a, um, a very difficult person to think highly of. Um, what comes out of his mouth, what he does, um, this time he's appeasing, but I believe it's in election mode. But he's had a history, such a long and sordid history, of doing the dirty on Australia and uh, and undoing us as a nation, certainly attacking the family through the um, payment system um, towards young mums, towards um, families who choose not to vaccinate. Uh, he and the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott both announcing that they are Christians, but in actual, in what they do, I find there's nothing um, that I would consider as uh, outworking of a godly policy coming from them at all. Um, so yes, the the deconstruction of our um, curricular base, our Christian heritage. This is ongoing under this man here. That's our prime minister there in the middle, and he's responsible as are that whole government are responsible for the deconstruction of our Christian culture. Um, look at this, please from the heart. They're marketing him um, as the face, as the face of the election uh, already. That's that's all I can say to it. I'm, I really am cynical but I believe that I've got an accurate um, assessment of the propaganda that's coming out of it. And this is really important for us to consider that uh, when we look at the news, when we take into account opinion articles and things like that um, they might be building something up, they might be building someone up and you're thinking hang on, this is, a, this is a, essentially a branch of government um, media is a branch of government. It is part of the government now that you've got politics, you've got administration, you've got legislation in the sense of the judiciary and the fourth branch of government is the media and that's what we're copying. Um, yeah, so it was interesting with the Epoch Times because uh, in the early days I thought they were really doing a great job uh, really doing a great job of presenting news, alternative news, but I can see, or at least that's the impression I get, that the um, the Chinese Communist Party pressure over Hong Kong is such to the point where um, it appears as if there's significant realignment in their policy. I could be wrong, and if I am, well, good luck. I hope they can lift the foot off their throat, um, which, is, um, which is totalitarianism. South China Post... Um, 
I went there this morning because Jack Ma, the billionaire um, marketer, the, the Amazon alternative, which is, of course, Alibaba in China. And I'll tell, it, tell the truth, I've actually used Alibaba to buy difficult to find things um, through industry suppliers and things like that. And they are very good service. Well, Jack Ma seems to be dethroned from his uh, position of significant influence in China. And this is all bringing the ultimate power to the um, to the president, uh, Xi, ultimate power. So, um, of course, it's a game of power and it's a pyramidal structure and some of the top players are routinely knocked from their position. Um, economics, employment as being 4% or less, as in 4.999 or less, and this to me is just propaganda. Um, I'm not convinced of the merit or the truth of the statistics. And um, you'll get as many economists as you'll get opinions. And I find this is just really um, the whole the whole thing about the economy is um, to me is just fabrication. Um, the fact is that I go to the supermarkets, I go to the shopping centres, and I see 60% or better of the shop fronts closed and boarded up. Um, this one here is interesting. Dr. Lee Merritt, orthopedic surgeon, Onawa, Iowa. Um, she's actually presenting the case that um, the end game for COVID is, is um, quite dystopian. And I, I will actually provide that link for, um, for our viewers to actually look up what she's got to say. Um, but I think that's an interesting, um, she's an interesting advocate for freedom. Um, that's how I'd put it. Now, we've got Rocco Galati being interviewed here, of course, the Canadian <clears throat> uh, solicitor who's fighting in the courts on behalf of um, individuals. And he's actually attempting to decipher the um, a projected, a sorry, a leaked document. And they, in this discussion with this young lady, um, they highlighted that the leaked document could deliberately come from government on the basis that they're actually testing and monitoring the um, public's resolve to having totalitarian imposed on them. Um, I think that's very important. Um, Spectator Australia, Bella da, da Brera, um, I found her articles excellent. Um, I think she's a very intelligent um, lady and I look forward to her videos, occasionally watch them. And this article here is about, um, yeah, about undoing um, history, undoing our culture. And in this case, the, um, the music greats of the past eras. This is interesting, this, uh, M, um, this MPP, Randy Hillier, Canadian, um, there's actually a sign of petition so that he is given the absolute maximum fine for um, his dissent against the uh, COVID restrictions in Canada. That to me is very interesting um, coming from, um, coming that they're actually turning, petitioning against um, politically incorrect views. And that's Randy Hillier again. I believe that's him on the microphone. And uh, let's just bring up a few more. Okay, Build Back Better. This is the World Economic Forum. And I saw a video this morning in which Key people from around the world are saying exactly that. Build back better. And if you happen to do the letter B in lowercase and you do BBB, you could quite quite easily use the numbers 666 to make it look like build back better. Um, I think that's uh, ironic that it's um, so similar. Um, I was looking for, in this case, the story of the New Australia. And here it is, the New Australia Settlement in Paraguay. This is the actual article. Um, and it's just, to me, it's an interesting, I guess it's an interesting concept to think that um, the utopian world that we're being driven into, people have gone and tried it. They've actually done it as a project, uh, a voluntary project. And of course it failed as soon as it was started because the only way socialism works is under a dictatorship and a, an absolute dictatorship. It's not dictatorship of the proletariat, by the proletariat, excuse me. It's a dictatorship of the proletariat, of the common people. It's a dictatorship of them. 
And that's what um, is going on in China, this absolute dictatorship. Xi is insisting on absolute power, and of course all his underlings are vying for the top job, and that's why Jack Ma is is uh, probably being dislocated. So it's um, to me this is an interesting nature of what's going on. While these people are in a frenzy for power, the, the uh, normal people, are, of course, are getting trampled under. They're getting trampled underfoot under this COVID lockdowns, the restrictions. Their businesses are going through the hoop. And yet this injection of new credits and these injections of new credits are very, very important because this is the tool, this is the mechanism, the bribe mechanism that everyone will have to accept. And that is the uh, under the banner of something like a universal basic income, but transitioning to Bitcoin, transitioning to a, uh, a uh, carbon-linked um, electronic currency. So it's actually linked to, uh, it'll have an end date to it. So if you don't spend your uh, credits, then of course they will just vaporize, they will dissolve. It really is an insidious mechanism of control. And that's what the Great Reset is all about. It's about world government, but not world government in a sense of a, I think the word is largesse, um, benevolent, but rather totally dictatorial, um, completely dominating every facet of your life. And that's, um, and that's where we're heading. That's where we're heading. Anyway, I'll open it up to the floor. I've had it more than long enough. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, Arnie, you were saying that you uh, seem to have had uh, one of your <coughs> communications with a correspondent uh, uh, vaporize. I should mention that uh, Wally did not get your email to advise uh, uh, him of the code for starting this discussion today. I had to say, I had to send that to him. So that that's happened more than once that emails you've sent out have not come through at our end, which is a curious phenomenon. I find emails are different now anyway. They used to be instantaneous and now sometimes they can take five, ten minutes to arrive if they do arrive, and I, I think sometimes they don't. So uh, anyway, on this uh, Build Back Better matter, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, Justin Trudeau, who is deeply into every uh, politically correct position you could possibly imagine, and who is functioning today as a total dictator and an intolerably unctuous uh, poser. He's it's just as though he is the suddenly become the father of the country. And he has this mellifluous voice as he tells people of the uh, uh, restraints that are going to be imposed on them now that we're at a new phase of fighting the COVID uh, menace. But he made a very interesting comment when he uh, alluded to this Build Back Better. He said, this is a this COVID COVID crisis is a grand opportunity for us to be pursuing uh, goals that we were already actively going after. Well, it's very interesting he made that comment because, as far as I know, we never told the Canadian people that he was setting up a uh, total restructuring of every institution in the world with the. Uh, control over the new institutions being vested in a bunch of unelected bureaucrats, which is definitely uh, the, the plan that is in, encompassed by the slogan of Build Back Better. There's no aspect of this that involves input from the population. So Build Back Better means even the end of even the pretense of democracy. I think democracy has been in rather lame condition for a long time, but now we're going into a system, if these people can pull off their coup, that will uh, eliminate uh, uh, popular input into politics completely. So uh, very interesting that Mr. Trudeau revealed that this was the continuation of an already existing program of reform. So they, they brought this in with COVID, but obviously it was being worked upon before the 
convenient crisis that has developed that has enabled them to, I guess, pursue it even more actively. We'll see how it all goes. One thing I have noted is that, you know, they have this program and it is very distressing because it seems to be destroying all our freedoms and all our traditions, uh, traditions that we valued and all our institutions, even the family, you know, but uh, there are unintended consequences to any action. And if you have a really large scale action, maybe the unintended consequences are more than the, the people behind the, the, the plans anticipate. And there are all sorts of things happening. For example, I think that there is a rejuvenation of Christianity, of faith, that we, 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 we would not have seen without this threat uh, to, uh, to our, our, our freedoms and to our, our families. People, generally speaking, still love their children and if their eyes are open at all, they won't want their children to be going into the kind of society that Klaus Schwab envisions for them. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a total tyranny and also a scientific tyranny in which the, the human being will have no uh, control over the integrity even of his body and mind. So it's, a, it's, it's something that has to be resisted. But there is resistance in Every country, as far as I can see. So there is not only, there is a, a separation of people because there are those who are for the COVID controls and those who are strongly against them, viewing them as a threat. But in every country, there are people who are uh, awakening to the threat that this uh, globalist scheme to build back better poses. And I think that not only is there a spiritual revival, a healthy spiritual revival, something that more realistic than a lot of the namby-pamby Christianity we've been seeing for the last century or two, but uh, also people in different countries from different cultures. I think they are seeing a commonality of interest. The attack is a worldwide attack, and people from all over the world are, are seeing it, and I believe communicating with each other and coming together in whatever way they can to resist it. So I, I'm not entirely pessimistic about our prospects for the future because uh, who did I hear say this? His mother said, uh, if you want to uh, have a, a colossal failure, make a big plan. And maybe we will be fortunate enough to see this uh, attack on our on our society and our freedoms end in that way mm, no worries thank you thank you for that robert that's a uh, an excellent assessment of um of that from that particular angle and i, I rem you reminded me of something that i said earlier on but i'll just reinforce it the to me the marketing of the conservative party in australia is pursuing the christian vote and they're pursuing it in my view um, if Christians look towards them for any sort of answer, they're delusional. They're delusional. It does not rest in them whatsoever. It rests in you. It's actually got to do with you as an individual accepting personal responsibility for your life and not handing it to the Prime Minister or any other person who would actually circumvent the, uh, the good work that you can do with your own life and you making your own decisions. Your thoughts, please, Sam Wallace Clink. Yes, on a year, culture will reflect the nature of the people uh, who you know, comprise the uh, population. And um, it's not going to come from some centralized source. So your answers are not going to originate in some place where certain people hold to have all the answers. We are created in the context of natural law. And it's not a question of anybody dictating the nature of that creation. That creation is simply natural. And we have gotten completely off it by taking advice from the wrong sources. 
I think personally that we have not had a Christian society. We've had a Christian society in the sense that people have had an allegiance to something they call Christianity. But I don't think that most people, when they're talking about Christianity, really have the foggiest notion what it's all about. I mean, most people, very few people, would oppose the idea of full employment. And yet, full employment is the dominant theme of every political discourse. But you know, the Old Testament said we will earn our living by the sweat of our brow. Life is going to be a struggle. It's going to be a miserable experience. Christ said, my burden is light. He said, seek the kingdom, the Holy Spirit, and all these things will be given to you. In other words, you are not going to be um, in a position of deprivation. You're going to be in a, in a position of abundance and freedom and happiness. Uh, there is no, no real content in, in genuine Christianity of any kind of uh, oppression, either in terms of politics, uh, relationships, or... Uh, or in, a, in an economic sense, there is abundance. Life is potentially abundant. But so many people are convinced that that's any kind of abundance, anything, getting something for nothing is going to ruin everybody. Now, that is a highly judgmental position to take. That's not a Christian position at all. You're going to stand in judgment of your fellow man because he's not working hard enough that is moving toward a communist totalitarian type of dispensation, not a Christian one. In a Christian one, things would happen by free, um, you know, voluntary action and thought, not something that's contrived or imposed or anything like that at all. In other words, people would simply be functioning, associating in accordance with natural law. Natural law, not human law. Not a communist, fascist administration. Not a dictatorial situation at all. But there are many people who just cannot see a society that is based upon that kind of freedom. They are convinced that their fellow man is not capable of living that way at all and that he will be ruined by too much abundance, too much freedom. You, could, you shouldn't have to worry about abundance or freedom in any context at all in a normal dispensation. It shouldn't be a concern. It should be a natural, evolved condition. So uh, I think that we have been badly misled away from a genuine Christian approach to life. And when we talk about Christianity, we're often talking about, well, oftentimes it's opposite, not what it really stands for. And that has led us to the edge of the abyss because we have taken wrong advice, sought wrong policies and objectives and this is where it's got us on the verge of a totalitarian world administration mm. because some people claim to be qualified to run everybody else's life. So it's... Uh, I think that we've gone off, we've gone astray, we've been pulled astray, and we have to somehow or another recover that spiritual awareness. I mean, what does the Bible say? It says about, uh, you know, um, fil filthy works. People are obsessed with works. 
like dogs going back to their vomit. This is not Christianity. Christianity is a free, spiritual, loving, open society. It has nothing to do with this type of compulsion and judgmentalism that we see that has played such a destructive role in shaping our society. So uh, much, more, much more could be said on it, I'm sure. But I'll leave it for the moment at that. No worries. Thank you, Wally. That's, um, that's certainly a challenging thought. The, um, I was thinking of the, the parable of the vineyard, of where the, um, of where the owner of the vineyard actually called laborers in. And some started early and worked the whole day, and some started at uh, noontime and worked, and uh, some started later on. And at the end of the day, he paid them the same rate. And, of course, someone objected to that. And his answer was quite simple. Well, I'm free to do with what is my own. And the fact was that the payment to each person was sufficient for that person to provide for his family for one day. That was very important. In other words, everyone had the same need and, uh, and not all do the same job but they all do what they can when it's time for them to do it. That was a very interesting um, analogy, and it's something that we could actually look at and uh, and look at and not be envious of someone who didn't do all the hard yards but still received sufficient. Very, very important, uh, our relationship with God, and to look at that and, and assess ourselves. And the other one, of course, is about the um, about those who were given, I think it was 10 denarius, each. Each was given 10 denarius and some went and um, amplified those denarius tenfold and others buried the, um, their, their denarius and they did nothing with it. Didn't uh, I think it was described as didn't even put it in the bank for interest. Didn't even. And yet um, the, the parable is about warning us with what we do with what we have. Each is given accordingly this, really the same opportunity. What are we going to do with what we've given? And that what we've given, of course, is our life. That's our life. Are we going to bury it? Are we going to actually utilize it to, for the best purposes? Christianity is a challenging philosophy. It's a very challenging philosophy, and it comes back to the individual when it talks about the kingdom of God being within. It means that authority and source of, if you like, inspiration to live your life actually comes from within your own person. It doesn't come external. It doesn't come from the bureaucrat. It doesn't come from the pulpit. It actually comes from within you. That spiritual awareness within you to live your life as you see fit, providing... The, present, the yeah. presence of the Holy Spirit within you. That's right. It's external in that sense, but it is not external in terms of looking to other people. No, no, that's right. I mean, if you put that sort of authority on another person, I can understand it when you're in a, a stressful situation when you, where you honestly can't see your way out and you need support and counsel. That's fine. But the normal going on of your life is up to you. I call that responsibility, your ability to respond to this life. It's certainly a challenge and it's a challenge for each one of us. And no one can live your life, only you can. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, the people who... Uh insist on a work in the way Wally has described, which uh, goes back, I guess, to what was described as the curse of Adam when he was driven out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, I guess these people's idea is that that curse is laid upon us for all time. But if that's their position, they're practically all hypocrites. Because they're not working 20 hours a day. I mean, should we work two hours a day or four hours a day or eight hours a day or all our waking hours? Should we even be allowed to sleep? You know, if work is the measure of the success of a society, the, the work of the human being, then where's the limit to how much work should be done? It, it just doesn't make any sense. Um and also the these these work advocates particularly the socialist kind 
want to standardize work. And the worst expression we've seen of this is when there was a communist revolution and the commissars go around and look at, inspect everybody's hands. And if you don't have calluses, they execute you. We've seen this in a number of countries. If you were not a laborer, then your life had no value. But this discounts all the uh, glorious achievements of the arts. It dis discounts the wonder of personality because there are people who uplift everybody around them merely by their smile, merely by their song, merely by their cheerfulness, you know. This is a, a wonderful contribution to be making to society. So it, 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 people who want to judge everybody on the basis of some uh, standard of uh, achievement in labor are, uh, are, are, are taking away all the fluorescence of life, all the, all the, uh, the, the creativity and the exploration of new ideas and new thoughts. So it's a deadly, deadly philosophy. And uh, I think it was you, Arnie, who mentioned the uh, all these communist experiments that have gone on through history. They were setting up little colonies in various places with theories that they could all share in the work and share in the uh, uh, fruits of the work. And all of these experiments failed. It was because they went against the human spirit. And... Uh, you could see, you know, the, there were a number of these in the United States, for sure. There were the Bentamites, and uh, I, I, there are many of them that could be, could be enumerated. I can't summon them all to memory now. But even the communes that were created in the 1960s, all these idealistic young people who uh, dropped out of society, their, their, their communes almost all collapsed because they didn't take into account the nature of human personality and the nature of the human spirit. It seems to me that uh, the basis of human relationships, if it is love, will just automatically lead to a successful society because people will be doing their own thing, the thing they choose to do because they do it well and they enjoy it. And if you like to chop wood, I like to chop wood. It's great. I don't like to chop wood all day, but certainly that's wonderful. And if you like to write music, that's great too. But if you do all these things with an attitude of love toward your neighbors, then you will have I believe a successful society because people will be caring for each other and yet they will be satisfying their own creative instincts. So right now we're in a situation with this COVID where there is an absolutely savage attack on this concept of society. They're trying to divide everybody. They're trying to keep everybody at distance from each other. They're trying even to prevent people from seeing the expression on their neighbor's face. It is a absolutely diabolical as far as I'm concerned. I, it's hard to imagine anything more perverse. But, uh, well, let's hope we, let's hope we come out of it because uh, it's, um, a total, a total perversion of what society should look like and how it should function. And we have been given a proper vision of this by the, the uh, instructions from Jesus about how we're supposed to live. That will lead to a successful society. Everything else will lead to, lead to conflict and uh, misery for a large proportion of the population. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. I wanted to actually introduce, uh, re inject something into our conversation today, and that is the word social credit. The word, I call it word, words, social credit. The Chinese are using it as a surveillance state. And uh, as I understand it, it was mostly the American um, IT firms that were responsible for actually developing and, uh, if you like, implementing it in China. 
and then of course from China it's gone out into the world. So the Chinese, it's called Chinese social credit, but the the words social society and credit, credit credo, I believe, or building up the faith in society, I believe it's actually a uh, it's a dissonating relationship of words. It actually isn't about social credit, it's about social discredit. It's about uh, rewards and punishment. And uh, and I think it's deliberately utilised. Um, the words have been um, abused so that we can't actually resonate with the words. Now, it was Clifford Hugh Douglas, Major C.H. Douglas, who developed the concept of building society's real credit building it, acknowledging it, recognising it, pursuing it as a science, where you actually look at where people can work together, can build societies and can increase the social cohesion, the social credit. They can actually do it. I would describe it as being essentially the building up civilization. That's what it's about. Now, we're watching, we're witnessing the deconstruction of civilization, of culture, and it's under the surveillance state. It's under what the Chinese label as social credit, but it's social discredit. So very, very important that we look at the words and the meaning of words because they they cause this dissonance, this jarring um, with our actual relationship with the words. And so it causes us to to actually be find it even more difficult to actually communicate. It's a very clever trick. And of course, if your words are perverted, then you can't actually speak the truth. You can't speak your mind um, for fear. Look at the genderism words uh, for fear, a mislabel. Someone's upset. Someone um, takes you to the commission, the commissar, not to the courts, but to the commissar. Um, if you actually use miswords words um, and things like that. Your thoughts, please, um, Wallace Clink. Yes, I don't think it's any. Uh, I don't think it's any uh, accident or any at all. Uh, even back in the days of the Bolsheviks in Russia, uh, I think it was uh, was it not Molotov who said that they know all about social credit, and um, it's the only thing that they're afraid of, or were afraid of at that time. So, uh, and I think from what I understand that the Chinese communists had downloaded a lot of information on social credit. And I think they have deliberately latched upon the term, the title, and turned it on its head, making it a, a surveillance uh, mechanism rather than a freeing mechanism, uh, giving access of wealth to the people in general without all sorts of onerous conditions but as a gift actually now you see the conservatives they're no less guilty in my opinion than the communists because they also believe in the idea of labor being a source of value well Today, labor plays, if it's actually analyzed, a very minor part in production. And it's, it's got to the point, I think, now where it's not possible to carry on uh, with the old method of production and distribution of incomes because the income simply cannot exist because there is no need for the labor. It's machines and technology and artificial intelligence that are the primary contributors to our stock of uh, consumer wealth. So what are you going to do if you can no longer rely on earned incomes to distribute the product? I guess you're going to do something like Mr. Trudeau suggests to experiment with new forms of economy. Well, <laughs> the new form of economy is not a really new form. It's a very Marxist approach that they're taking. And, um, no, we, the problem is that we should all have an inheritance and conservatives believe in private inheritance, but boy, they don't believe in public inheritance, social inheritance. That is socialism in their, in their books. And um, they're completely misguided on this. The, the um, discussion was 
a lot while ago about how the, the workers were paid differential incomes. But their incomes through their work or contributions through effort were not the only basis for their total incomes. That was their earned and diminishing in the modern technological world source of incomes. But their primary source is inheritance, the cultural heritage, which is above and beyond what they earn through their work. And if you get to the point where you virtually automated the entire economy, where hardly anybody is required anymore to work, how are you going to distribute this obvious abundance that is being produced? It, it just comes to a screeching end. It's, it's irrational and impossible. So there has to be a form of inheritance that fills that increasing inadequacy of purchasing power. And, um, and you see, so we have an inheritance and, and the meaning of life is not just to work and work and work and work and work some more. And when you can't work anymore, engage in a war in order to have destructive work that gives you incomes, but destroys the basis of your physical economy. So the conservatives have in my opinion, a wrong and quite frankly, an evil conception. I think it's based on conceit, it's based on pride. And uh, I think that there is a source of income that comes not from humans, but from God, from nature itself. And we have to make sure that individuals have their rightful access to that. And the social credit means, of course, is to national dividends to all citizens equally and um, compensated retail prices where the retailer is uh, compensated so that he can, he or she can actually reduce the price of consumer goods as we become more and more efficient and it costs less to produce. We should have the benefit of falling prices. Mm. Thank you and we've that. been robbed. We've been robbed of that. That's our inheritance. And it's the financial system that has robbed us of that. And it has engendered attitudes of envy and resentment in the society, which completely misperceive the nature of what has happened. Yeah, yeah. I, you've actually touched on something that's so valid and vital for us to consider and put on the table today. And that is this business of the universal basic income, which is being proposed by governments around the world under different banners. I think in Australia it might be called job keeper or job seeker. But this universal basic income, in the end, it goes to something like um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin being an electronic um, value, if you like, a, a, an electronic value that actually has an expiry date and tied in with carbon credits, tied in with the actual carbon footprint that goes with it. And this level of insidious control, this to me is the final nail in the coffin of freedom. And that is that the, that the government becomes the custodians of your cultural inheritance and the government issues it based on what the government determines as their legitimate right or edicts. Now, bear in mind, a government is made up of other human beings, whether they're elected or they're actually uh, climbed their way to the bureaucratic top. The fact is that they are made up of other human beings. And how dare they administer your cultural inheritance? And that's where we're going. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, if you look at the achievements of the technological achievements of mankind going back hundreds of years, thousands of years, they are really astounding, are they not? It's been an accretion of knowledge that has enabled people to uh, perform miracles of, of, of production. And yet, is it not strange that from one day to the next, people can be shut off from that incredible inheritance they have, that, that cultural, technological inheritance. 
We've seen it. We've seen it in the the so-called Great Depression of the 1930s. Things were booming like crazy and they were building skyscrapers and uh, the economy was flourishing. And then suddenly there was no money and people were uh, digging ditches for 25 cents a day. And this was the result, apparently, of the evolution of this fantastic technology. It didn't make any sense then, and it doesn't make any sense now. And as far as I'm concerned, we are always in a great depression because we're never realizing the benefits of this technology that we've inherited. And that is because the economic uh, principles, according to which we operate, doesn't attribute uh, to people the, the right to participate in this. But it's all there. And it, it should be analyzed and a system should be devised whereby the inheritance can be made effective for, for people living today. Uh, this was the focus of the social credit that Major Clifford Douglas uh, developed in the uh, 1920s, 1930s, and 40s, I guess. And uh, the whole point of his thinking was to take this technological inheritance and use it as a basis for establishing individual freedom as complete and as perfect as it could possibly be. And this can be done because money is a very uh, uh, divisible substance and it, it, you can distribute it. Douglas uh, proposed means whereby it could be distributed and the benefits would go to all members of society. Um, now, that was known as social credit and social credit became a very significant international movement during the period when Douglas was advocating it. He traveled the world, he spoke to huge crowds, he testified before parliamentary committees, he testified before kings. And actually at one point, there was quite a bit of interest in his ideas on the part of uh, large corporate and financial interests. But when his proposals to use the uh, technological potential of society to liberate the individual, to give the individual control over his, his life and destiny to the maximum extent, then the large corporations and the financiers abandoned it. And actually they financed to the tune of millions, I understand, propaganda to destroy the message that Douglas was putting out. I know they did this in Canada. There was a famous humorist, a world, world reputation as a humorist, uh, Stephen Leacock, and the Canadian Bankers Association paid him tons of money to go out and ridicule social credit. Uh, so the, the same thing was going on in uh, countries around the world because they recognized, just as the way the foreign minister of Russia recognized, that social credit was actually the greatest threat to their control over society. It would allow for the development, the organic development of society rather than this centrally planned uh, development. And whenever you have centralized finance, you inevitably have uh, central planning of society. The, the, the two automatically go together. So uh, there was that, uh, social credit, which was dedicated to uh, liberating the individual. And now everybody has heard the term social credit today because it has become uh, uh, modeled in, in, uh, in China, but it's exactly the opposite of what social credit in its original form was striving for. It's, it's a, a system whereby the individual is constrained, controlled, and dominated totally and has no uh, control over his life 
that is guaranteed to him in any way. So I think it's more than a coincidence that the term social credit has been stood on its head in that way. It doesn't make sense that they would come up with exactly the same term as those people in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s who were promoting a personal freedom on the basis of technological capacity that the world probably had never seen. We don't know how every ancient civilization worked, but uh, the social credit vision then was of uh, a society of free individuals pursuing their own interests, uh, cooperating freely under no compulsion. And it's uh, now been turned into this concept of uh, total domination of the individual. I think this is uh, intentional sabotage. It's thrown confusion into the meaning of that expression, social credit. It's very unfortunate, and it's going to be a major task now to distinguish the two. Social creditors, the original version, would like to retain the expression that they developed, and it's been hijacked by these uh, centralizers of power. It's a, it's a, a very devious and uh, unfortunate uh, turn of events. But uh, in one way, <clears throat> it might work to our benefit because at least the expression is out there and uh, people can go to uh, Wikipedia and see a quite reasonable uh, uh, explication of the original meaning of a social credit. So if they're hunting for the, so the Chinese social credit, they might actually end up landing on the wholesome and uh, Christianity-inspired social credit of the previous century. Hmm. Thank you for that, Robert. That's, um, that's beautifully put. And it is, it's a valid consideration, um, the meaning of words and how our language has been hijacked so that we, uh, we get confused about what's actually being discussed, what's being talked about. And, um, and you can see it every day. You can see the politically woke who will pursue things, but they will use language to confuse you. Peace is war, black is white, um, even genderism. Um, you, the, the discussion, the argument about genderism and identification, in the end it becomes so threatening, so intimidating, that you, you daren't open your mouth. Your thoughts, please, um, Wallace. Um, closing comments, if you're good to go. Yes, uh, certainly the... Um... The idea of social credit has been inverted on its head. And I think that actually uh, originally much, much effort and money was spent by its opponents to try and discredit it. However, I think at present time they have decided that maybe the most effective method would be to appropriate the name and then put forward ideas and policies which are not compatible, but what you're running out of the name to mislead people and into thinking that this is actually something to do with social credit. It isn't, of course. And I think that that probably is a change in strategy. I know the woman who in more recent years wrote a book called Social Discredit um, revealed, in my opinion, that she really didn't understand it very well, certainly philosophically or technically. However, one of her colleagues or associates said that this thing has to be destroyed because it, if it isn't, it will impede all of our progress. So it seems to me that there's clear intent of a malicious nature to misrepresent for specific interests and to um, distort the whole thing and destroy it thereby. So, um, but you know, Douglas did not really approach the point, the thing from a specifically religious standpoint. In fact, in his book, The Monopoly of Credit, he said it's primarily a mathematical problem. Well, he developed the ideas in, 
later on and much more into philosophical areas. But originally he was approaching it as a science, from a scientific standpoint. There was a deficiency and the system didn't function properly. It couldn't function properly because it couldn't dispose of its product. And industry could not recover its costs. However, social credit has been called since practical Christianity because it is actually compatible with the most fundamental aspects of Christian philosophy if they're looked at in a realistic and uh, fully you know, appreciated manner, which I've indicated before has not happened because we have not really understood social credit. Um, Christianity. Christianity has been presented largely as something that applies to a future time. Well, that's not what Jesus said. He said, you don't, he said, you call me Lord, you call me Lord, you run after me, you run after me, but you don't do what I say. And he didn't mean doing something in the future, he meant doing something right now. There's no time like the present the present moment. There is only one time, and that is the present moment. So, um, and he said his burden was light. And he said all these things would be given to us if we sought the kingdom. That's the spiritual thing. If we get properly attuned with the nature of the, whatever intellect, intelligence it is that rules the universe, then we would be aligning ourselves with what has been called the Holy Spirit. In other words, we would be establishing a natural and realistic relationship with reality. And that's where we've gone wrong. We have thought of Christianity as something applying to another time, another era in the future. It applies right now at this very moment but we haven't learned how to access it and how to appreciate it and to live it in our everyday experiences we haven't incarnated in our organic affairs the social credit ideas and principles that is such a so beautifully put there wally that the incarnation is for now it's not for a future time it's not for eons it's not for the end times it's for now mm. what a wonderful challenge what a wonderful revelation that's been misconstrued for so long um i don't know that i've ever actually heard that from the pulpit i don't know that i have i think it's always about that the uh, you've got to pace yourself you've got to work your way through you've got to be like sheep and all this sort of stuff because the uh, once we are in heaven, everything will be fine. And of course, that's the, I don't believe that's the Christian challenge at all. I believe that it is for now. And it is for bringing about God's kingdom. Christianity is a now religion. Your thoughts and closing comments, please, um, Robert Clank. Hang on a sec, Robert. I've muted you. Sorry, bud. Okay, go. You talk about uh, what message comes from the pulpit, Arnie. And I would just say that it's a, a distorted message. It's a, a misleading message because the people who are speaking from the pulpit don't understand the nature of the financial system and the potential that is within it for the living of a Christian life and for the bestowing as much as you possibly can the opportunity for a Christian life on all your neighbors. And that was discovered accidentally. That's like a, a, a strange gift that uh, society has been given uh, by Major Douglas when he made this discovery of the uh, flaw in the price system. And he came up with proposals for correcting that flaw which could be used to uh, rejuvenate, to uh, uh, just to transform society and free us from all these compulsions 
and controls that uh, people who want to dominate their neighbors have put in place. The social credit of Major Douglas would have freed mankind from that to such an extent that we would see a society uh, unlike anything uh, man has known for, for as far as we have memory. But the potential is there. And if the people in the pulpit could only be uh, uh, illuminated and brought to understand that there is this potential in the economy to generate the, po the opportunity for a Christian uh, life, then they would have more practical uh, advice to give to the, uh, the uh, congregation. There have been some groups. There was a group in Quebec that studied social credit. It was uh, a bishops, and they concluded that there was uh, nothing objectionable in social credit from a Christian standpoint, and that indeed it was compatible with Christianity. I don't think they gave it full endorsement. There was a, a group in Scotland, a group of uh, 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 religious people there who made the same study, and they came out with a, a, a very specific endorsement of social credit proposals. So there have been instances in the past of uh, Christian organizations that have looked at social credit and seen the potential in it to uh, release society from its uh, abstract uh, uh, <laughs> yes, it's bondage, indeed, bondage, and to uh, uh, allow a, a truly Christian life to flourish. And that, I think, is uh, what uh, a major portion of our, our uh, efforts to get the social credit message out should consist of, because there are many people who consider themselves to be Christians, but they haven't glimpsed the potential of the Christian message to make a, a society of people who could genuinely love each other. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. Be beautifully put. I'm just going to um, cut across to our websites and do a, uh, a do a summary of what's available to uh, to our viewers, our listeners, and our readers. This is the alor.org front page, and you'll find our videos are um, chronologically laid out. So the latest is always on the right and they progressively work their way through to the left, which is the reverse of, uh, of what we normally do. Uh, normally you read left to right, but I've laid it out that way. That's just the way it's turned out. From the videos comes the podcast, and then I produce the on target um, with input from other people. And in this case, we've got an excellent, um, an excellent cutout here, an excellent extract from Hewlett Edwards, Common Sense and the Vote from the Social Creditor, 1947. He writes this extract beautifully. It's as if it was written today. Um, it's so timely, um, these prophets. And then, of course, the social dynamics. You want to, there is actually a move afoot where parents um, responsible for students in university are actually withdrawing them from the indoctrination camps and giving them a practical education through trades and skills exposure rather than indoctrination through the education system. I would could recommend social, these social dynamics videos as an excellent um, learning option to actually renew your mind, to actually undo the, if you like, the destructive influences of the brainwashing through our universities and through our learning institutions. Um, the social dynamics booklet by Butler, Essential Christian Heritage by Butler, and of course, Releasing Reality. Complementing the three videos, and of course, with the videos come the podcast. If you prefer to download the podcast, they're there for you. The resources are there within our libraries, within our um, videos, within our podcasts, within our weekly journals, our monthly journal, New Time Survey. The resources are there to actually um, 
renew your mind, to actually build up your Christian faith and recognize that Christianity is as current and as relevant today as it ever was. And it does have the answers. If we understand what our Christian faith is really supposed to be about and then incarnating it, um, the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. I keep saying it, but it's it's just so, to me, it's so vital. Um, it's such a challenge. It's a, it is a challenge, but what an adventure that we can actually play a part in bringing about God's kingdom. What an adventure. What an opportunity. And of course, the um, the joy in just... Um, of just turning away from those things that need to be turned away from and turning towards the light, the light, the light of life, which of course is our, our Lord, our Lord the Christ. Thank you so much, Robert and Wallace, for today. I really appreciate your input as this week as in every other week. Thank you, Arnie. Yes, Arnie, thank you very much. It's a, a very profound um, study and... Uh, I just hope that uh, we can move more and more to a serious exploration of it. No worries. All right. Cheers then. Thanks, Wally. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.